Animal Hospital was ill-prepared for Pokemon Go. The sheer number of injured Pokemons overwhelmed us. And their owners, mostly kids, had spent all their money on Pokeballs and had nothing set aside to treat injuries. Pitting a Magikarp against a Mega Tyranitar results in a poor outcome. We're good, but we're not that good. And there were other things we were not prepared for. Okay, so what is this? This is a Charmander, who evolves into Charmeleon, and eventually a Charizard. That that giant dragony thing? Yeah! Breathes fire, flies around. Oh, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> How the hell do you give an injection to a squirrel? Hi, Mrs. Kaiser, it's Dr. Walton here. Picture! Yes, Anakin is fine. The procedure... Break up through! The procedure... Yeah. Break up through! Break up through! Break up through! And, yeah... Break up through! And... Break up through! Seriously, so Break much through. The Charmander evolved! It's chasing a pigeon! I got more Pidgeys. Are you gonna do Pidgeotos? No. How many do we have now? 20? What are we gonna do with them all? a fun little video that my staff and I did uh, when Pokemon Go came out. Uh, and the reason I use this is because I want people to understand something about the reptile hobbyists. Part of this is a collector mentality. And, and it's part of the problem is that there's always something new and shiny that they want to collect. And this has a, a, the, a problem in that it winds up bringing people who only have limited time, space, and money wind up collecting more animals than they know how to deal with. And we actually do see a lot of problems with hoarding because of it. Now, I am a member of the reptile hobbyist group. I have been keeping and owning reptiles my entire life. As a matter of fact, my first pet is a three-toed box turtle that I got when I was seven, and I still have her. We estimate she's about 55 years of age, and she's in my will to go to my kids. My kids don't know that yet. <laughs> but they don't get any other inheritance unless they take care of the turtle. Now, I do a lot of work with the BC SPCA Cruelty Department. And over the last few years, I've been involved with some cases, some of which even, well, you may even be aware of here. One of these ones was Trooper, a, red, a, um, a golden retriever puppy that was uh, starving to death in Maple Ridge. We recently, last year, had what's called the Langley 66, 66 dogs from a uh, breeding facility, puppy mill, that were kept in the most horrific conditions. And the Whistler sled dog investigation, where we basically had to exhume uh, over 100 dogs. But reptiles, reptiles have actually wound up being the one group that I have seen more cruelty, more neglect, and more problems than any other animal. Now, we oftentimes see reptiles in the news. Uh, this was uh, one in my area where we wound up having 100 snakes ranging in size from 24 inches to 15 feet all being kept in what would most likely be described as a den or a small bedroom. 50 of them were euthanized as a legal species. We had a venomous snake that was being shipped from Southeast Asia to Winnipeg, where an animal control officer was then transporting them to Germany to get by a few um, irregularities with, or basically a way to get them into Europe with uh, less uh, uh, governmental intervention. In Alberta, there was a massive seizure of a place called Drumheller Reptile World. Uh, this place was an absolute horror show, but turns out this was actually a rescue facility that the uh, Alberta government and the British Columbia government were sending reptiles to when they were confiscated. This guy would, uh, because Drumheller uh, is a tourist destination, would have lots of business during the summer, but would shut everything down in November, turn off the lights, turn off the heat, and come back in April, and anything that survived, great. Anything that died, he'd just buy new ones. 
this was actually reported to the officials by a veterinary, fourth year veterinary student. She actually got in trouble with her vet school over this whole thing. Uh, she was being lambasted online. If you, you think trolls are bad, you should have seen the stuff that she was faced with. I, on the other hand, just sat there going and offered her a job. She still works with me. Here in Ontario, we had a guy who actually is really well known within the reptile industry here. I, I grew up here, I'm an Oakville boy. Um, and he was actually one of the, the mainstays of the reptile industry, but when he died, he didn't have a very good will and there was a lot of fights over who got to take what animals. We talked a little bit about uh, these uh, mobile zoos. This is uh, one of the guys we have in British Columbia. We have three in the lower mainland. All three have wound up having problems with either the BCSPCA, Conservation Service, or other governmental entities. And here in Toronto, in Ajax, we had a copperhead just running around a park. And of course, there was the guy whose house got broken into and a bunch of venomous snakes got stolen out of St. Catharines area. And recently, just again in the same area, they found a venomous snake in a truck. Who's playing with apparently the owner's, I think it was dog. <laughs> And of course, the situation that everybody's aware of. One in New Brunswick where two boys were killed by an African rock python. Now the problem with, and I know we've got a few uh, humane societies, SPCA and, and other animal control officers. The problem you're gonna have is when you are presented with cruelty investigations with these animals is you have a tendency to treat these investigations as if you were dealing with a puppy mill or a dog and a cat. And the problem with it is, is as, as Clifford's been showing you, there's a lot of different issues that you're gonna be dealing with when you're dealing with reptiles. So let's talk a bit of what, how big the problem is. Now we estimate 57% of households in Canada have a pet, and look, the vast majority are gonna be dogs and cats. We know that. Uh, so we figure there's about six million dogs, uh, eight million cats, but nine to 10% of Canadians have pets other than dogs and cats. And those are things like birds, fish, you name it. Now we don't have any statistics really on reptile ownership in Canada. Uh, we, if we take a look at the states, we know about between two and 3% of households will have an exotic uh, reptile. And if we estimate that out and kind of use that to Canada, because there are some similarities in on how we handle pets. We figure about 400,000 households in Canada have some kind of exotic reptile. 100,000 just here in Ontario. Now this industry, and, and, and Clifford kind of has gone on the international trade, but there's a domestic captive bred trade. And I'm gonna be, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. And, and that trade really didn't start up until about the 1980s and 1990s. By the time we came to 2011, it came, it was like a $1.4 billion industry. And these were mostly North American small businesses that were producing animals for local consumption, but also for the international market. And a lot of these were small time breeders who started to see money and started to build into bigger and bigger um, uh, uh, numbers of animals. And these businesses have expanded, so in, there's basically been shipping a lot of these animals out of the country in 2009. 11.3 million reptiles were exported out of the United States. Granted, the vast majority of those are reddish sliders. Uh, there's big farms down in the Carolinas. Uh, and, but we still have a large number of reptiles being imported, 900,000. The other thing that's really interesting from the pet perspective is this is actually one of the few areas, or if this is actually the area of the pet industry that's growing the fastest. As a matter of fact, they're seeing an increase of 70% um, over, uh, I think it's um, 10 years, 12 years, uh, in how many people or how much business is associated with the reptile trade. Yet, if you look at dogs and cats, that's only a modest increase of 35%. How many uh, animal control officers do we have here? Okay, you guys will be interested in all of this because I'm gonna tell you this. Your problem is gonna be snakes. Lots and lots 
of snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? To quote Indiana Jones. The problem is, these are extremely valuable animals. You can make a lot of money if, you're, if you know what you're doing, or lose a lot of money if you don't. Um, they're, and the thing is, you can keep large numbers of them in very small areas. For the last 20 years, these have been the animals most sought after. These are the ball pythons. This is what they look like. And the nice thing is, is they only get about that big. Um, and they are able to be bred into all kinds of cool colors and patterns. Now, back in the 90s, a guy named Bob Clark came up with the first albino ball python. That was retailing for about $15,000. The pieds came along. Uh, they were retailing, that was a really cool morph. They were retailing for $25,000. That was in 1997. Uh, there's a big distributor down in uh, the New England called Nerd, uh, and uh, Kevin McClurry basically produced the first spider morph, which was worth about 25 grand. And this was made. A, this was a pattern change, so it made a lot of people excited. But the problem with it, these all come up with a neurological problem. Their heads kind of do this wobble. So basically, we're breeding in a pattern at the at the expense of the animal's brain power, basically. Uh, the pinstripe, which is a morph of the spider, also has the same issues. And more recently, we're starting to see the super black pastels, and this is producing a lot of interesting animals. And of course, uh, the last five, ten years, bananas and corals have been really, really popular. Now we're getting into scaleless snakes, too. That seems to be the new trend. I want to talk about this one. This is an ivory ball python. Gorgeous snake, black eyes kind of a creamish color. These were going for about $125,000 when they first came out. People were like, this is cool. The problem is they found out that you could take two lesser morphs and breathe them together and get the same thing and all of a sudden the price dropped. I actually own one of these, which I bought for $200. And that's actually the very snake that I own. This is the current value of the wild ball python. Value in terms of, yeah, you could go to a pet store and they'll sell them for 75 bucks, but anybody in the reptile trade <laughs> won't buy them. As a matter of fact, you go to a reptile uh, show, they'll just give them to you because they just want to get rid of them because part of the problem with the breeding is occasionally you produce these and there's no market for them. As a matter of fact, and we were just talking about this just at the end, I have euthanized over 40 of these in the last 12 months. Now, in all fairness, I did rehome one. Three months later, it came back. And I, don't, that's just 40. You don't want to know how many red ear sliders I euthanize on a yearly basis. They're an invasive species in British Columbia. The last time I took a count in a year was over 200. And I love turtles. So you'll understand I'm a little pissed at this stuff. Now, this is the Princess Diamond. She was a white leucistic boa owned by a guy in the States called Jeremy Stone. The reptile community lost their ever-loving mind when this animal was found because it opened up the, uh, basically the um, entire boa market to the same thing that ball pythons were going through. The initial estimated offering was that these were gonna go for about $65,000 a pop. So that one snake would produce 10 to 20 animals. So yeah, you could see that it'd be worth a million dollars. Now, of course, there's always little complications. Turns out this animal had been stolen from a zoo in Brazil. Brazilian government didn't quite appreciate that, so they sued him and they got the snake back. Uh, and him and his wife actually pled guilty because they, they actually practiced the smuggling operation. This yeah, you, you guys, one of these days, you're gonna walk into a basement like this. This is 1,400 animals. This is half of a basement. There's another wall on the other side. 3,000 animals in one basement. And they're now making equipment specifically to provide these types of breeding facilities. Here's the problem, this whole whole thing is a pyramid scheme. This whole market is designed to breed this animal into all of these colors 
And the problem is, there's no end market. You go to PetSmart, nobody there is going to spend $400 on a fancy ball python. The whole market is designed that the big breeders sell to lower breeders, who sell to lower breeders, who sell to lower breeders. So then you have things like the ivory ball python that was used to be 100 grand, now worth 200 bucks. Well, or now, some of the morphs I can't find homes for. Now there's two types of genes, dominant and recessive. Dominant means that you produce one and every single one of the babies will look like that. But you can understand that how quickly the price would drop if that was the case. Now recessive genes, they're fun. Recessive genes mean you breed that animal to another animal and the babies don't look anything like the, the one that you want. You then have to take the brother and sister, breed those two together, and a very small percentage, 25%, will actually show both uh, uh, versions of the gene. And now you can start breeding. So you get much more value out of a recessive gene. So we're here at the BC Reptile Association's annual reptile show. We have over 2,500 animals on display, varying from turtles, tortoises, repti uh, reptiles like snakes, lizards, chameleons, basically the full gamut. And the majority of these owners are experienced reptile people. However, you're also going to have a, a, a fair degree of newbies coming in. And this is actually used as a main, major training event. Almost all of the animals that are here are captive bred animals. And, and it is the breeding of these animals that's actually causing this industry to expand to the degree that it has. Now, I, I, I work with a lot of the people that are in this industry, and some of them are amazing people that do wonderful things for their animals. Some of them are more interested in producing animals at the lowest price, and they don't give a rear end as exactly what's going on. I'll use an example. One of the things I talked about was reticulated or Burmese pythons. They're massive snakes. 15, 20 feet long. On one seizure, we found in a closet four Rubbermaid tubs, this big, stacked up one on top of each other. Inside each one of those was a 12 to 15 foot Burmese python, which was just wrapped around the water dish. So some breeders, problematic. The thing is, it's a cash business, it's low overhead, there's always new people coming in thinking that they're going to be the next Ke Kevin McClure and make millions. They're a specialized market, and there is a certain degree of money laundering. Why? Because very few uh, Canadian revenue agency officers can say, oh, that's a $60,000 snake, that's an $800 snake. So you can do some <laughs> creative accounting. Now this is uh, for the current laws in British Columbia and Alberta. So in 2007, a woman outside a 100 mile house in British Columbia was killed by a tiger. In response, the BC legislature instituted a bunch of new rules against exotic animals. These, inclu these include a lot of the big cats, all of the primates, and several species of reptiles. And this legislation is called the Controlled Alien Species Act. So you might be wondering why we are filming this. And the reason is, is these animals are all, all illegal. I can't show you them, but we still want to cover the topic. So uh, we're videotaping this. Uh, when the legislation was announced, I had a pretty good idea that there would be some of these animals surrendered to the SPCA. So I decided to apply for what is called my Controlled Alien Species Rescue Permit. And lo and behold, <laughs> the legislation became law and lo they did not have a rescue set up for them. And the first day, the SPCA wound up acquiring a Nile monitor that was brought to do the animal hospital. Well, thanks to the work of the SPCA and uh, a little bit of media attention, the government got their arses in gear. And lo and behold, I now have a rescue permit. Now, the advantages are we can actually take in these animals. The disadvantages are... I'm the only facility. That means over the last eight years, we've wound up having various species of crocodilians, uh, venomous snakes like rattlesnakes, uh, as well as giant lizards and giant snakes. Uh, so we're gonna be talking a little bit today about 
the various controlled alien species that you might be involved with. Uh, this will be broken down by the following. There are three species of poison dart frogs that are illegal, and they are all of the family Phyllobates. These include Phyllobates bicolor, Terribilis, and Oritania. Now, this is not one of those species. This is a Dendrobates azurus, but it's also a poison dart frog, and it's not illegal. Uh, these animals are on the list because they're poisonous. Poisonous animals are animals that are dangerous when you eat them or touch them, except these animals actually aren't. You see, these frogs are only toxic when they eat the poisonous insects of their native jungle. In captivity, they're quite harmless, and it's a little bit of an over-exuberation on the government's part. Is they are quite beautiful, though. Uh, now, the other reptile that we have to be concerned about is crocodilians. And I think the reason is pretty obvious why they're illegal. marks out here. They go at a direct right angle to the direction of travel. No digs in the macadam either. Somebody was hurt. There's blood all over this thing. What is this black menace that kills everything it sees and hears? <coughs> no human mind could imagine the enormous destructive power of this maddened, killing thing. If you're young people in love, look out. <laughs> You're driving a lonely road. You're as good as dead. Now that clip was from the 1950s. And as you can see in real life, those animals are nowhere near as big. Now, illegal lizards are broken down into two categories. The first are the venomous lizards, such as this one, the Gila monster, or Helodermata suspecticum. The other one is the Mexican beaded lizard, the Helodermata horridium. Now, these animals, as I mentioned, are venomous, which means that they are dangerous when they bite you. Now, good news is their envenomation process is a little bit different. Their saliva is venomous, and because they don't have fangs, the only way for them to hurt you is to literally chew their venom into your skin. Now, that means that the rule here at Dudney is that if you do get bit, you have to limit it to only five minutes. Beyond that, that's a problem. Now, and all kidding aside, these animals are relatively safe to deal with, but because of the venom, we do understand why these animals are considered illegal. And the second type of lizard is the members of the family Varanidoid. And these are also known as the monitor lizards. Uh, the best example would be the Komodo dragon. And as you can see, these are powerful animals with strong tails for striking, and their jaws are very powerful with lots of teeth that are capable of shredding. <clears throat> their bite is also quite dangerous because their teeth are covered with bacteria. So a prey item, even if it survives the initial attack, will shortly die a few days later from sepsis. Now, these animals are completely inappropriate for the vast majority of owners because of their large size and aggressiveness. On the other hand, these are actually one of the smartest reptiles going. These animals are capable of learning simple tricks. For instance, this lizard is trained to follow a tennis ball, as well as they have the ability to count. If you train a lizard that there are six eggs hidden within its cage, and then one day provide only five, they will tear their cage apart to find the sixth egg. So while these can be wonderful animals for individual owners, they are so large and so powerful that they are considered inappropriate. And if you do come across one of these animals in any investigation, care has to be taken. Clean this out today. Okay. Now, snakes are likely to be the most common exotic animal that you come across, and these are broken down into two main categories. The first one that everybody is most concerned about are the venomous, or hot snakes, such as this Indonesian or Chinese mountain viper. This animal was actually uh, smuggled in through uh, the, the post office. Now, these animals are easily available online and shipped throughout the country on carriers such as Delta Dash. Uh, and these owners represent a very small subset of the exotic pet ownership. 
And we do have at least two venomous reptile owners here in the British Columbia, and they are owning them illegally. And there's at least one in the lower mainland and another one in the interior. Now, these animals in general are extremely experienced, but accidents do happen. In the 1980s, a man in Maple Ridge, where I practice, uh, was bit by his own snake and ran out in the street and died shortly thereafter. So one of the things I'd be recommending is if you are dealing with a snake that you are not familiar with, it's best to get some identification. Now, these animals are often available as low as $50 for a copperhead, some of the more expensive ones, about $500. And the reason for their low prices is because of the fact that there's such a low demand. So I said, this is a niche uh, reptile. The problem with this is the, while the snakes are relatively inexpensive, the antivenom can cost several hundred dollars per vial, and each vial can only last for a couple of months. So for that reason, a lot of the reptile people that keep these animals do not have anti-venom on hand. So for instance, in the case of this Chinese pit viper, there is no anti-venom available in all of North America. So you'll understand we are very cautious on how we take care of this animal. Uh, so one of the things you have to keep in mind is the you know, dose dependent. Now, this is a very small animal. So even if it was to bite me, its ability to, it, basically I would be in a lot of pain, but I wouldn't actually be life threatening unless I had an allergic reaction. Now, so for safe handling of hot snakes, one of the things we recommend are these PVC tubes. What you do is you find a tube that is the, just a little bit bigger than the snake itself and you basically just using your hooks guide the snake into the container and now once it's in there you can safely handle it and it can't do anything to you now this guy has picked up a bit of an infection so we are treating it with antibiotics which means every single day we have to take it out and give it some anti uh, medication my anaconda don't my anaconda don't my anaconda don't want none unless you got Finally, the exotic animal that's going to be causing you the most, uh, and excuse the pun, pain in the butt, is the constrictors. Now, there are three main species. Oh, lovely. <laughs> he <laughs> peed on me. Uh, there are three main species. They uh, include the boa, uh, the ana which includes the anaconda species, but it can also include the common boa, though it's extraordinarily rare for these animals to exceed three meters. It'd be kind of like finding shack on the street. Is it possible? Yes, but it's extraordinarily unlikely. So the anacondas are going to be the big one for the constrictors. Uh, the other group is the pythons, and they're going to be the one that you're most commonly going to come across. Uh, these are animals that are bred in assorted colors and morphs, and they actually can be quite beautiful, but it can also mean that identification is going to be difficult because they can look so different, especially when they're quite young. Uh, this family also includes the African rock python. This is uh, the species that is connected to that horrible case in New Brunswick. Now, this species here is the reticulated python. It's a long but skinny reptile. It can easily achieve three meters in about five years, but can pass five to six meters in length uh, when full grown. The species is beautiful and is often kept in large numbers. My personal experience is this snake is about 50% of these snakes are nice and 50% of them are assholes. And when scared, these animals, as you can see, will naturally constrict. And I don't know if you can actually see it, but my hand is actually turning red because of how tight it's holding on. And uh, so when they're scared, they will naturally constrict. And that makes handling difficult. The policy of Dudney Animal Hospital is that when these animals are being handled, we require a minimum of two people. Uh, and uh, if this animal is over three meters, uh, we need three people. Uh, one spotter and one person to help get the snake off of me. Um, now, recently the US government made these animals illegal. And the reason, uh, and these are, uh, the concern was that these would become uh, native to the United States or become breeding populations within the southern United States. And so they passed a thing called the Lacey Act, or an addendum to the Lacey Act, that made interstate transportation of these animals illegal. However, the reptile lobby group, ARC, or the United States of Association of Reptile Breeders, 
their lobby basically made it so that any of their members can still sell these animals and they can they can still go across state borders. They cannot be imported from Canada to the United States. That's completely illegal. And complicating this is that there are some subspecies of the reticulated pythons that are considered a dwarf species. And you're going to have people who have these snakes saying, no, no, this is a dwarf. Well, they're still considered, even the subspecies is still considered a species, uh, a member of the reticulated python group. And even if they are smaller than normal, they are still considered illegal. The next animal concern is the Burmese python. These are the what I call the Great Danes of the snake world. I would say about 80% of them are giant sweethearts and 20% of them are, are aggressive. Now this is a very heavy bodied snake. Uh, it can easily reach up to 200 pounds, which means, that, or 80 kilograms, which means while they're gentle giants, you still have to be careful with them. And finally, you have the rock pythons and anacondas. I have never in 40 years of working with reptiles, I have never never come across a nice African rock python or anaconda. And these animals are completely inappropriate. And yes, I do think that the snake in New Brunswick would have hurt those boys. And as you can see, any of these families, their natural reaction to stress and fear is to constrict. And now I'm going to have my lovely assistant help get this snake off of my arm because it's starting to hurt. <laughs> that's it. And that was, that's good. My anaconda don't. My anaconda don't. My so, how do you work up a reptile or exotic animal inspection? One of the things I'm going to tell you right now is you're going to need a veterinarian. And the reason you're going to need a veterinarian is so much of this is going to come and when you're in front of a judge explaining that these animals are ill or suffering or dealing with pain. And the problem with it is, is you're gonna have a difficulty finding very many veterinarians with expertise. How many vets do we have here? Okay. How many of you feel that your exotic animal rotation at Guelph was useful? Yeah. Uh, and, and they did their best. They were fantastic with birds, and the, but the reptiles were, were problematic. So the good, news, the good news is it doesn't take much to get up to speed. Really, I do recommend two books, Doug Mater's, and also, and the one that I love the most is the one coming out of Britain. Um, and, and they produced a really, really good book. And, and this will give you enough expertise to be able to stand in front of a judge and say, no, this is, this is what the veterinary standards are. So when you are going on one of these inspections, it's important to bring along some specialized equipment. Look, some of it's pretty simple, a camera, um, because you're gonna need to take a lot of photos. But a cell phone is also incredibly useful. Two reasons. One, you can um, just do a quick Google search, and a lot of times you can kind of figure out what animal you're dealing with. Or better, and this is what we do in British Columbia, they, they live video me, with me, so I'm at my clinic, and if they're doing an inspection on the island, they'll just show me the cages and I'll go, that's disgusting, that's disgusting, that's dead, that's illegal. And, and I find it quite useful. But another one that you wouldn't think of is colored masking tape. And the reason for colored masking tape is what I'll do is you're dealing with, on, oftentimes you're dealing with inspections of hundreds of animals. And all I'll do is I'll take like, green tape and go, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. If I have an issue like the cage is too small or there's no water that's yellow, yellow, yellow. If I have something that's, oh, I don't know, dead, being eaten by the rat, then I can use red. And, and I'll spend more time on those particular ones. Another really useful tool are these temp guns. And what you do is you can actually take temperature uh, readings inside the cage at the hot and cold side and have a pretty good idea if the, there's a problem. Like for instance, one cage is too hot or too cold. Another trick with these, look for large bodies of water. A lot of these places will have like a crocodile or a snapping turtle uh, or red ear sliders. And if you take a look at the water and take a temperature of the water, that'll actually give you a pretty good idea of the long-term temperature of that enclosure, especially if you go in first thing in the morning, which I recommend. And what you do is you take a look at the temp. We had one facility, that um, very popular facility. We went in and the temperatures were 63 degrees. Sorry, I work in Fahrenheit. 
That's too cold for tropical species. So what the guy was doing was, and this was winter, was when everybody left, he turned the heat off for the night. They still had heat lamps, and he thought that was enough. But for the aquatic animals, the temperatures were literally under 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Another one that works really well are these um, uh, laser thermometers, or laser rulers. It makes you it really easy, especially in some of these enclosures that's kind of hard to measure. You just kind of, uh, uh, you can do some really quick measurements, whoops, um, to determine uh, how big the cages are. And of course, you need specialized equipment like snake hooks so you can handle these animals safely. Now, these are my turtles, uh, Pokey, and, uh, sorry, Pokey and Nancy. Pokey is uh, one that was uh, dumped off on me, uh, but Nancy is the one that I've had my entire life. One of the things that I've been using lately is, um, it's a little uh, camera adapter for your cell phone uh, that has thermal uh, cameras capability. And what I do is I take pictures of the enclosures, both with it and uh, on, and uh, just a normal picture. And I could actually show a judge that, oh look, there's only this little tiny area of the enclosure is heated, the rest of it's cold. And then you can show, hey look, I've got 12 lizards that only have a two foot section of heat available to all of these animals. And you can actually show a judge that this is not, not acceptable. Other things you're gonna need is, if you do have to seize animals, you need a way to transport them safely. So things like, uh, these are snake bags, but in a pinch, you can use pillowcases. Uh, pro tip, check the corners of the, uh, yeah, yeah, because snakes find holes really well. And then what you do is you do zip ties, and you always double zip tie it, because uh, they will find a way through. Then Rubbermaid containers are great for transport. And what I oftentimes will do is I'll take an instant hot pack. You can get them at Costco. They give you three to four hours of heat. And what you do is you, you duct tape it to the top of the Rubbermaid container. And what you do is when you're going into the uh, facility, you, you, you basically uh, turn, activate a bunch of these so that by the time you're ready to do the seizure, you, they've kind of heated, preheated the Rubbermaid containers. Now, when you're doing the inspections, how many of you, the officers that are doing this feel comfortable assessing a reptile facility? You, uh, are, are you, okay, yeah, so yeah, that's good. A lot of times people aren't. And so there's gonna th be things that you wanna look for, specifically caging, and you're gonna see a lot of wood caging. And this is going to be a common refrain in that I say that reptile people will spend $1,500 on a snake or a lizard, and bulk uh, or uh, complain if they have to spend more than 50 bucks on caging. So they make a lot of wood cages. The problem with it is, is there is no way, no matter how well you seal that, that you can sterilize that. So great if you've got one animal that's gonna spend the rest of its life in the cage, but if you're gonna have animals go through it, this is just a way to transmit disease back and forth. The next most popular one is glass aquariums. Well, uh, we've already talked about transparent, uh, board, sorry, ETB, yeah. But the other thing is, is they don't insulate well, which makes them really, really hard to heat and to cool, depending on the situation. A lot of uh, reptile breeders are going to PVC. There's advantages and disadvantages. Big one is uh, lack of ventilation, um, but um, they are also much more expensive. How big is big enough? And we're gonna have a conversation on this one. For those of you in Canada, it's the L theory. And what you do is you take the length of the snake and the, width, the length of the cage plus the width of the cage should equal the length of the snake. And if you are interested, the BC SPCA has a whole pamphlet on this and you can get it from them. So that means that if you have an eight foot snake, it requires at least a six foot by two foot cage. And we also have them for lizards, turtles, tortoises, and whatnot. Here's the problem. These minimum standards are crap. I am telling you right now, listen to him. Clifford is the one who knows actually the sizes. 
So why am I putting this stuff up? Because I'm not here to tell you what size of cage your reptiles should be in. I am here to tell you what size cage you need so that uh, if you're doing an inspection, you're able to go in front of a judge and say, hey, this is too small a cage. And the reason is, is while Clifford's uh, standards are accurate, mine are what are in the veterinary textbooks. And you don't want to be in front of a judge and saying, look, this animal needs such and such a cage, and then they pull out, uh, the, the defendant pulls out the textbook, says, no, Mater says you only need this. So this is unfortunately a legal standard, not an ethical one. This is the most common reptile or snake holding cage. Good old Rubbermaid container, 23 by 16 by six inches. There are snakes, I've had snakes, ball pythons, that's the most common one, but I've had boas in here, I've had carpet pythons, animals way too big. Now it might be an appropriate size for a little hog nose, which you only get about that big, but for everything else it's inappropriate. Now we talk a lot about the requirements for heat, UV light. Now the problem with heat is, you know, during the day the rooms warm up, the rooms cool down. So how do you keep a constant temperature in a snake cage? Well, the ideal situation is you have a thermostat. And the one I love the most is the Herp stats. These are the gold standard. Basically, they have a little, uh, they basically will keep a tank in a certain range. You can actually program it so it's a little cooler at night. It's, it's wonderful. Um, There's still things that can be done with improvement. But, uh, you know, Reptile people will try and find a way. And so there are some other ones which uh, you can get at uh, Mr. Pets or PetSmart. And uh, basically, they're still a thermostat and they still kind of keep it in range, but you kind of have to do a little bit more work. And you can't change the temperature if uh, you want to have it cooler at night. Uh, so there's advantages and disadvantages. Now, I've already stated once, reptile people are cheap. So this is what you're going to see a lot. Good old dimmer switch. And they hardwire it into the heating pad. And what they do is they turn it on and they kind of tweak it a little bit and then wait half an hour and check the temps. And if it's still cold, they tweak it a little bit more and wait and eventually they get to a good temperature. And then what they do is they draw a little black line on here and then another little black line on here. And I see this a lot. Problem with it is that just, tell, that just says that, okay, if the ambient temperature is 20 degrees or 25 degree or 20 degrees Celsius and you want it at 30, then it works great. But if it's a hot summer day and the house goes up to 30 degrees Celsius, that whole system will go up to 40 and you will have cooked snakes. <laughs> There's a few people that have experienced it. <laughs> now, right now, FlexWatt heat tape is the most recommended uh, way of heating a lot of these cages for the snakes. Uh, it doesn't work well for lizards, but you know, snakes are gonna be what you're dealing with. Um, and they need to be controlled by a thermostat or they can burn the animals. But what did I say about reptile people? So a lot of times they'll take heating wire that you would get at the uh, hardware store to put under your bathroom tiles so your tootsies are nice and toasty. They also have a great ability to toast your snakes as well. So if they ha you have a screw up with your thermostat, you're gonna have uh, these uh, temperatures reach way too high and burn your animals. Reptile people are? Cheap. So one of the other things they'll do is they'll go to the, um, the pharmacy and they'll pick up good old heating pads that you, you put when you, you got, you're cold in the winter. And what they do is they only have three settings, um, low, medium, and high. But you'd be amazed how many reptile people will use that and just set it there and go, okay, that's good enough. Now there are, just so you know, because I know there's a few reptile people, there are people who have enclosures that are amazing. Unfortunately, as you all know, there's a lot out there, more unfortunately, that don't. So we, as veterinarians, deal with thermal burns, which means every time you do a, an enclosure inspection, you need to lift up every single animal and look for this. You'll find it a lot more common than you think. Why? Because Actually, I'll, I'll let uh, Clifford talk about that as to why thermal burns are so common. A lot of your animals, turtles, tortoises, diurnal lizards, arboreal lizards, require ultraviolet radiation. And what they do is they take UV light to produce something called vitamin D3, which they use to take calcium and phosphorus to produce bone. 
you do not have UV light, they don't have vitamin D3, and they develop all kinds of metabolic bone disease. Those bulbs last, and the most common one are the fluorescent bulbs, and those last about six months and you have to replace them. What do I say about reptile people? So you're gonna find this. They're gonna say, no, 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 I mix oral vitamin D3 in with their food, I'm good. There is no study that has actually supported that. Yeah, there's a few that said there's some absorption, but they don't know if it's an effective or a, a, a sufficient. So oral vitamin D3 for reptiles that require UV light is a no-no. So one of the things I say is, if you're doing an inspection, spend 35 bucks on eBay, pick up one of these UV monitors. They're not good. They don't tell you, you can't really go and say, okay, there's um, a sufficient amount of UV light coming from that bulb. But what you can find out is if there's any UV light coming from those bulbs. Because especially in rescue centers that, or uh, places that think they're gonna be inspected, they'll just put a regular fluorescent light bulb in that has no UV, ho hoping you guys don't know the difference. Oh yeah, and every Halloween, <laughs> some reptile people will go to the stores and collect all the black lights that are now on discount and use those. Yeah, no, we get cataracts out of that. So for you inspectors, what do you need to look for? Well, biggest one I've found is water. You know, pe people who are sold reptiles as low maintenance pets. What apparently that means for a lot of people is you only have to look at them once a week, clean the cage, put some water in. So we find oftentimes no water in with these animals. Overcrowding, reptiles are not social creatures. We know that if you put two bearded dragons together and they don't get along, they will bite each other. And of course, inappropriate housing for specimens. And we see that a lot. Basically, people will put reptiles into anything. Yeah, so you're gonna see a lot of injuries. There are still a, th what's the term, um, um, uh, the husbandry one? Folklore. Folklore husbandry, that live feeding is ethical. There is no, they don't need the mental stimulation. There's no prey drive like that. They, they will get injured and I deal often with bites and injuries from uh, live food. You wanna check for parasites on the skin, also in the feces. And you need to look for vet records. There's never any vet records, but you gotta look for them anyway. Here in Ontario, you're gonna be dealing with this, snake fungus. Snake fungus is in your uh, Massasauga rattles. It's going, they're already an endangered species. If it gets into them, it could, could do some serious damage. It's already damaging the timber rattlesnakes uh, south of the border. In British Columbia, we actually had one facility that tested positive for snake fungus. The problem with it is, is this was, these animals were, even though I told the guy to euthanize them, he kept them. And he was keeping them in his quarantine facility. The problem with the quarantine facility is you had to walk through the quarantine facility to get to the rat bins that he was selling to the reptile community as feeders. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Inclusion body disease. Now. I got lambasted by the breeders of British Columbia a couple of years ago because I started explaining to them that we're starting to see inclusion body disease in reptiles here in British Columbia. They thought I was full of it. I finally had to pull out um, uh, that, I had, uh, that a board certified pathologist had identified this and that we had sent samples off to the University of Florida for PCR testing before they believed me. And this is a growing problem that you're going to be finding within the reptile community. Chytrid fungus wiping out frogs all over the globe. We had an outbreak, a bunch of tree frogs that died suddenly in British Columbia. Unfortunately, the owner had frozen the frogs. So when they came to me, we did histology and we had what looked like chytrid fungus, but we couldn't do any PCR testing to confirm it. Now imagine if they had um, aquatic frogs and they had done a water change and flushed that water into our sewers. Well, we'd have a lot of dead frogs in British Columbia. This is an example of inclusion body disease. Uh, they, the snakes roll over, they have severe respiratory science, it's horrible. Ranavirus, you recently had a couple of cases of ranavirus here in Ontario just a few weeks ago. Uh, this virus has a very high mortality in box turtles, but it also has a very high mortality in frogs. Your, um, the, uh, the conservation service will be closely, closely monitoring 
for this. Now, you're lucky. You get to see some photos. So if any of you are uncomfortable with really disgusting photos, this is the time to leave. But the reason I can actually show you these photos is because the person who had done these to these animals surrendered them to the BCSPCA, who surrendered them to me, which means these are my animals, and I get to show you pictures of my animals. This is a frilled dragon. Does this look like a healthy animal to you? Mouth rot, severe dermatitis, emaciation. This is what we found all over the skin of this animal. We actually identified, we thought these were snake bites. But they went to UBC, they had no idea what those mites were. This is what a frilled dragon is supposed to look like. What do you think? Healthy? This is a leopard gecko. Now, do these eyes look right? No. See, these eyes had an accumulation of debris. That's what you see here and here. Now, do you think if you're doing close inspections of your animals, you'd notice that? Well, of course not. <laughs> because these guys have thousands of animals. So this took a 15, 20 minutes to fix, and we were actually able to adopt out this animal. We weren't so lucky with some of these other ones. This one had a piece of fabric wrapped around his leg. We found it sitting on a log right next to the, uh, the window or the, the edge. So it was really obvious. It was sitting there with like this piece of fabric stuck around. We figured it had been on there for several weeks. As a matter of fact, when we took x-rays, we found that the bone was actually uh, rotting. We thought about amputating it but an ultrasound showed that it actually had abscesses throughout its body and we wound up euthanizing. Um, iguanas fight. Keeping a bunch of male iguanas around together is just a recipe for disaster. As a matter of fact, iguanas are horrible pets. They should never be kept. Um, these guys all had multiple wounds and basically due to an inability to find homes that literally could take care of an animal that gets six feet long and likes to eat you, at least, at least for a couple of months each year when it's horny, uh, we decided to humanely euthanize. This is another leopard gecko with severe dermatitis on his face, it's got mouth rot, and all along the tail. Again, if you're inspecting your animals on a fairly regular basis, you should have caught that. And the fun part of this one was we figured this was a dermatitis, mouth rot, stomatitis. Eh, yeah, we know how to do it. We cultured it. Yeah, we found a whole whack load of gram-negative bacteria. No big deal, but it wasn't getting better. It kept shedding. So we're thinking, okay, maybe it's hypothyroid. It happens in lizards. Finally, we took a sample of it, and it turned out to be something called can -V, or yellow fungus of bearded dragons. This is a bearded dragon disease. Now, there's lots of bearded dragons in this facility. So now we have a facility that has taken a disease that has devastated the bearded dragon community and put it into leopard geckos. Just so you know, we shut down, oh, and sorry, and finally, this perfectly 110% healthy chameleon. 110% healthy. Finally, after three months, we got it from this to this. Two feeding every day by my staff, because we really wanted to have at least one, well, we had one other. We wanted to have some thing survive this. And after two months, we felt it was in a good enough condition that we could take it off of tube feeding. We did, and wasn't acting right. So I brought in a board certified <coughs> veterinary ophthalmologist, and it turns out he's blind. So I'd spent two months rehabbing this one only to euthanize. When you're doing your inspections, keep track of statistics. This is gonna be the most useful thing when you're talking in front of a judge. And what you do is when you're doing your cage inspections, put a little blue dot if there's no water, cage is too small, yellow, red if the animal is in distress, ill, sick, or anything along those lines. And then you can actually have situations, you can put multiple dots, cage too small and no water, or you know, all kinds of things. And the advantages are you can come up with statistics to show the judge that 60% of the animals didn't have water. 
60% didn't have K2, or you know, you can use those statistics to show not just the problems with individual animals, but that it's a systemic problem. And don't forget the food. You have to maintain the same quality and, and welfare of the rats and mice that you're feeding to the animals as you do the animals themselves. And reptile people are horrible for this. Am I running out of time? No? Okay. So, a couple of things. You need to make sure that they're healthy. You need to kill them ethically. And what I mean by that is there's two ethical ways. The first is you take the mouse by the base of the tail and you go at the, on an edge of a table breaking the neck. And then you take the mice and you twist it. It's called cervical dislocation. Anybody want to do that? No. The other way is CO2. It's actually a very humane method. Problem that is, is reptile people are? So what they will do is they will take baking soda and vinegar and mix it in a thing and put it in and hopefully it'll kill the mice and rats. Even the slightest airflow will disturb the laminar level uh, flow on the surface and will allow for enough oxygen to keep these animals alive for a prolonged period of time. So you need to have a tank. So you need to see if those facilities have a CO2 killing chamber for their mice and rats. They don't because they're feeding live. They just won't tell you. And sacrifice some of the mice. Look, you're not going to find homes for them anyway. Sacrifice them all. They're all going to be bad anyway. They all have mycoplasma because these facilities are horrible. So this is a mild to moderate lung on a rat. It's common. I don't like it, but it's, it's what I'd be expecting. This is a moderate to severe lung. And this, this is worse than what you see on cigarette packages trying to make you not smoke. 30% of the mice had this, 30% had this, and the rest had that. And the reason is, is they were keeping the mice in the same building as the reptiles. Well, all those heat lights, the, the whole building heated up to like 35 degrees Celsius. So the rats were kept at, at that temperature as well. And they suffered. As a matter of fact, when we walked in on that inspection, one of the rats was being eaten alive by other rats. I'm going to do the, yeah. This is the story of many of the reptiles and amphibians who were sold at PetSmart and other pet stores. At Reptiles by Mac, a massive exotic animal mill, a PETA eyewitness saw countless animals arrive in tiny containers, sometimes from halfway around the world. These turtles frantically clawed at the side of the crates, desperate to get out. In its two warehouses, Reptiles by Mac kept tens of thousands of animals crammed in filthy, barren plastic tubs, often without adequate food and water. Parched and dehydrated animals clamored for water and drank for several minutes after being given water by PETA's eyewitnesses. Finding emaciated animals was par for the course for PETA's eyewitness, like this bearded dragon, who was desperate for food and water. This is what a healthy bearded dragon should look like. Countless animals never made it out of Reptiles by Mac alive. PETA's eyewitnesses documented the agonizing deaths and cruel killings of hundreds of animals. Animals who got loose were caught with makeshift glue traps, pieces of cardboard covered with double-sided tape, which weren't checked for several days, leaving them to struggle and die a prolonged death. Others frantically attempted to escape, tearing their skin and dropping their tails as they thrashed around. Bearded dragons were kept in severely crowded tubs and had to fight for food and space, resulting in horrific injuries, some with nearly severed, infected limbs, exposed bones, and bloody wounds were denied adequate care, and often just left to rot. I'd be amazed at how little it's done for the sick ones here. I've cut legs off before, I had legs before. It didn't budge, and all I had to do was with wire cutters. We're a wholesale distributor, man, so anytime, like, I'm complaining about, you know, the health of, like, a certain animal, or, like, one or two animals, 
problems. I feel like, honestly, in their eyes, it's just like, well, if it dies, we'll just buy more. Some reptiles were put in small bags and gassed with carbon dioxide. Workers described animals being thrown into a freezer while they were still alive. It needed to put down a long time ago. Usually I just throw them in a fucking cooler. I've seen them frozen in a freezer, like trying to get out. And this is what it's all for. Thousands of animals were shipped to PetSmart and other stores in crowded containers with no food or water. And Reptiles by Mac is the sixth supplier of pet store chains that PETA has exposed. If you would like to help these animals, please go to PETA.org and tell PetSmart that enough is enough and to stop selling all animals. And please, never shop at pet stores that sell any animals. Thank you. So, I told you, I am a member of this community. I work closely with some people that truly, truly love their animals. The reason I'm here is because I'm telling our community that we have to make changes. Because if we don't make changes, I will be the first person, as is every other exotic vet, to be siding with the government on banning them. Because if we can't take care of them, we shouldn't have them.